in here. Uh, I get Sorry. very, it's okay. I get very enthusiastic about speaking to adults. Um, and uh, it's because we really do have a chance to move ahead with a better community for our kids with disabilities without, um, if we can all get on the same page. So I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you to Mario for organizing it uh, and to Task for having me. Um, my name is Judy French and I'm from Pacers National Bullying Prevention Center. So most uh, people know us through our websites. Uh, we have three, we get about a million and a half visits a year to these websites. Um, the one on the left uh, is for really mainly uh, focused on uh, what adults might need for bullying prevention. Uh, the one in the middle is for middle school, high school. The one on the right is for elementary school. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit of the history of PACER. Some of you may know uh, PACER Center, which is based in Minneapolis. It was formed in the late 70s to help families who had children with disabilities navigate the public school system. Uh, from there, uh, we branched out into 30 different projects uh, and have continued working on behalf of children with disabilities, but also a couple of national products that, that um, endeavor to um, advocate for all kids. And this is one of them. The National Bullying Prevention Center is something that grew out of our work for children with disabilities, because I'm sure that most of you know that children with disabilities are bullied at a rate of two to three times their peers without disabilities. And so we've been doing bullying prevention work all along, but in 2006, we decided to be very intentional about it for all children. And as I said, mostly the public knows us through these three websites. Um, everything that we have, all of the information up there, the content is based on good research. So it's not just that we want uh, people to understand uh, that building communities is a good idea. It's that it comes from research. It's not just that we want people to be kind, accepting of difference, respectful. It's because those qualities help us build good communities. Those ideas all come from good research. Uh, statistics and facts, everything is up there and everything is for you. Uh, to take. There's really nothing that we sell up there. It, we are resource people and we want you to take good messaging back out into the world. And that's why we get really excited when we get to speak to a group such as yours, um, because we know that you will do that uh, and you can help us create a world without bullying. So today we're going to talk about what bullying is and what it isn't. If you've heard me speak before, this may feel like, you know, oh, we've heard these ideas before, but I have new research for you to add to those ideas. And I find that actually it's very good to remind ourselves of what the dynamics are of bullying. That word, that bullying word gets thrown out a lot, uh, especially in schools and families. And sometimes it doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, so we, mu we must be sure that with the language that we're using about something like bullying, that we are precise and accurate and that the ideas and the messaging we send out about what to do if it happens or what to do so that it's less likely to happen. All those ideas that we put out there are sound and come from good ideas about, you know, what can really help? And again, those ideas that we're, I'm gonna be bringing to you today come from research, come from really good studies, looking at um, you know, what targets need, what the kids who are bullying need, the whole equation. Then we're gonna talk about your advocacy, because if I know anything, I know that adults that advocate on behalf of children with disabilities are fierce and strong and their advocacy is powerful. And you do not stop until you get what you need for the children that you care for. So we're gonna hopefully you know, affirm what you've already been doing, give you a couple more things to help your advocacy, and then talk about like, how do we move that idea into our children's lives? How do we teach them to be better advocates 
uh, in whatever way that they can to express what they need. Uh, strategies for working with the school. We are very much at PACE are very much the type of people that want to promote partnership with the school. We do not want to set you up for an adversarial relationship with the school. It doesn't help. So we have lots of ideas about that as well. Um, but strategies for all of that, you need them. We all need to make a plan when bullying is anywhere in the picture. Again, we are prevention people. Uh, what we want you to think about is being a few steps ahead of anything that might happen. Now, I know that sounds like the ideal, and maybe it is, but we really want you to be thinking of prevention. So many people don't think about bullying until they have to do intervention. And yes, we'll speak a little bit about that too, but I just want to make sure that you know that my mind is always oriented towards prevention. I wanna think ahead. Because if we're only ever talking about intervention, it's like putting out a fire that never goes out. So we really wanna be thinking, how do we do the things to, to, to create a community where bullying doesn't happen as often? Yeah. All right, so to start, I want you to think of what adults told you when you were young about bullying. And many cultures, they don't use the word bullying. That's the word we use here in the United States. And that's what the, the word we'll be using today because it's most common to use that word in schools. So even if the word bullying or bully was never used, think about what you were told, what the adults told you, especially if you came home and said, oh, you know, something happened to me. Uh, or something happened to a friend, I saw something, I don't know what it is. Many, many of us, and the, the advice is still pretty much the same through generations, but many of us were told the things that are up here on the screen. Yeah, you know, bullying is just something that happens as you're growing up. It's just the thing of childhood. You know, if you survive it, you'll be stronger. You'll be stronger for it. I had um, a father at a presentation once say to me, bullying made me the man I am today, very proudly. And I thought, oh my goodness, okay, <laughs> there's a lot going on there. Um, some things for you to know right off the bat, because you often will get into conversations like this, um, where could be someone who is teaching your child, someone who is working with your child might say, well, that's just a part of growing up, what, what they saw. And you may think, mm, I don't think so, because this keeps happening over and over. So you may get into conversations with people who genuinely care for children um, and maybe even very educated, but they have something back in their head that they were told. And these are many of those views in this right up here. Uh, bullying's not a natural part of childhood. It is a learned behavior. It's a learned negative social behavior. And so if you're thinking like I'm thinking, you hear learned behavior and you say, well, how are they learning it? And can we unlearn it or can we be teaching different things? And yes, yes, absolutely. We learn social behavior through viewing social behavior. We know it's okay to do some kind of behavior because we see others doing it. We may not have those thoughts exactly, but we know what's okay by seeing what is okay generally around us or what is done. Um, so bullying's not natural to childhood, not at all. Despite what it might look like, no one is ever born knowing how to bully another, okay? They learn that. And words do hurt, we know that. Uh, bullying does not make kids tougher, whether it's with words or fists or whatever, uh, it doesn't. Um, words are just as powerful as physical harm, and those things can take someone down. Bullying breaks kids up and takes a while uh, for some kids to heal. And for some people, the effects of bullying last a lifetime. We don't know for some people if they ever quite get over it. So we want to avoid that. I know you want to avoid that for the kids you care for. Um, the one, of course, from a disability advocacy perspective that really 
gets at us is that some people deserve to be bullied. And on the face of it, that's a horrible statement. You know, no one in their right mind would ever agree with that. And yet in practice, all you have to do is look at some of those entertainment news shows or the radio in the morning when you're driving into work and you need to hear what the traffic is. Um, there's always someone that it's okay to make fun of. And the way that trickles down into kid world is if they if children see it, that it is okay to laugh or be disrespectful to some group, yeah, uh, that can kind of trickle down to them and to their minds that there must be, you know, I can make fun of this kid, this kid's different from me. Um, so that's fine. You know, that's what works in my family. And, you know, to be honest, that's how it was in my family. We all teased each other. And I took that right into school and found that that's what keeps you from having friends. So in the beginning with some people deserve to have to be bullied, it's, it can kind of come from family cultures, uh, but it does blossom later into saying, you know, you don't talk like I do, you don't walk like I do, uh, you can't, you know, retain your spit when you talk or when you chew your food, or you don't know, you know, for some children who don't have social skills, they don't know how to be friends and kids will exclude them if they find it difficult to play with them or they're annoyed. But a lot of those cues come from the adults that are around too. So no one deserves to be bullied, that is for sure. But we have to be careful there with some of the subtleties that happen in adult world around, you know, around our feelings about who, you know, who is okay to be disrespectful to. Um, the one that I need your help with for sure is telling a teacher about bullying is tattling or snitching. Uh, kids are quite clear about this. When you talk to uh, an adult as a child, when you go to an adult to tell them about what's happening, if you think it's bullying or someone's been mean to you, that can just get you into all kinds of trouble socially with your peers. So there's a lot of prohibition in kid world about doing anything like that. And we need to make that distinction for kids that telling's what you do to get help. And if it's a problem like bullying or anything that makes you so anxious that you, you can't sit in class or you can't learn or you're so unhappy, you don't wanna be at school, you need help for that. You're not supposed to fix that yourself. It's not tattling. Tattling is what you do when you wanna get somebody else in trouble. But in the case of bullying, you need someone more powerful than you. So you're going to need to talk to an adult. Most bullying, just so that you know what the research says, most bullying will not resolve in a healthy way until a caring adult is involved. So it's the last thing that most kids want to do. If children could solve a bullying problem on their own, they would. They would not come to us. There's great shame attached to bullying. They wouldn't come to us to fix it for them. So they need us. And we need to know. You'll hear this throughout the presentation. We must keep the lines of communication open as much as we possibly can. Listening, and if a, in the case of a child who, who is nonverbal, watching, looking, seeing the cues that let us know something's not right. All right, so let's go to a good definition. This is the place where most people think they can define um, they think they've got it. And then in truth, um, you know, it, there's some real subtlety. Bullying is a complex behavior. There is no single definition out there of either bullying or cyberbullying. Everyone's definitions from school district to school district to state education code to, you know, what might be in your parent student handbook will be slightly different. They might have the common pieces that they need, but they will be different state to state across this country. So what you have to know is first of all, this isn't a legal definition. It is what we call the hallmark. So we've taken what's common in really good definitions uh, from reputable places. We've taken out what's common and they're here for you to see here, but not a legal definition. Hurt or harm, the target cannot stop the behavior they can't stop it because they don't have the same amount of power as the individual or group who is doing the bullying. 
Okay. So three things that I want you to put in your head so that you can remember. Um, and hopefully these will stick. Hurt or harm. And that could be body, mind, whatever. Um, target cannot get it to stop because they don't have the same amount of power as the people doing the bullying. What's really important here to know is that a lot of the advice we give targets, like, you know, my friend's son who's being bullied because he's nine, he brought a pink stuffed elephant to school. And the teacher said, you're nine years old and you're a boy, you should not be bringing a pink stuffed animal to school. And his mother who knows me said, I'm unsure why you're telling my son to correct his behavior and not the boys who are bullying him. And she was right. Right. So we give a lot of advice to the targets, but remember the targets don't have the power to change it. You know, my father said, just pop them in the nose and they'll never bother you again. That also doesn't work. My mother said, ignore it. Yeah. And they'll just stop if you just ignore it. Again, we confer the responsibility onto the target but the target isn't the one. <laughs> they can't get it to stop. They need someone with more power to help them get it to stop. Um, there is something too that is missing from this definition right here. They used to be in it. And we'll talk about it in just a second, but it's, it's intention. So it used to be, and you'll still see this in every legal, de legal definition, hurt or harm done on purpose, hurt or harm done intentionally. And that's beginning to be removed from definitions. We caught onto this a few years ago because it's happening kind of quietly. Um, and now I see around the country that there are many definitions are reflecting more the imbalance of power and less about intention. This is really important, especially if you are caring for or advocating for or working with children with disabilities who may never be able to tell you that this thing that happened to them was done on purpose. In fact, it's quite difficult for most kids and adults too to say what the intention was behind an act like this. You may feel it was done on purpose. You, you may know, very difficult to prove. So what often happens, what we don't want to have happen is that there's a delay in creating you know, safeguards and, and making a safer, healthier situation for both the target and the, the folks doing the bullying you know, to get it to stop because we have to wait and have an investigation. We don't want you trapped in that rabbit hole, right? So what we want you to be thinking about is intention versus impact. We want you to be thinking about impact, yeah? So if you have a child who's not going to be able to tell you what the intention is, let's not get stuck there. Let's look at what the impact of whatever happened was on that target. So you said that he just tripped over your foot, but he sprained his ankle and he's sitting there in the corner and he said, this has happened before. The impact is he doesn't wanna be at school, right? So something's happening here that's a little bit more than he tripped over your foot, okay? Let's look at the impact. You said this seat was safe. And so this girl hasn't been able to sit at your table all semester. Is that really what this is about? She's now not wanting to eat in the cafeteria. She doesn't think that anyone wants her to, you know, she doesn't have a place there. She doesn't belong. The impact is she doesn't feel like she belongs on this campus. So we want you to be thinking about impact versus intention. We think it's a better place to go, especially for children who may not gain the social skills or the social awareness to really be able to talk about it. Uh, I think it relieves adults too from having to be all NCIS, you know, detective work about what's going on. We want that for you because you have a lot of other things to do. Um, the other thing that I didn't bring up was this idea of repetition. Now, normally or usually bullying uh, is a repeated act. So it's part of a pattern. Right? If, if the action is severe enough, um, that it causes a, a you know, a, a huge uh, impact for the target, it may only happen once and that's quite enough. But usually there's a pattern of behavior that precedes um, a big event, like, you know, some kind of horrible, uh, severe act. So most definitions, most legal definitions will have repetition in them. 
that too is, is, is a problem for us at Pacer because, and I think you probably feel this way too, uh, is, is we don't really want acts of bullying to repeat, you know, to be able to call them acts of bullying um, because we don't want that to happen at all. Um, but it is generally, we will probably not hear about um, some bullying, you know, until it's happened a few times. This is another reason why we really need to have the lines of communication clear and open with kid world whether that's your own child or children around your child, people caring for those children so that, you know, somehow we really are listening. We have our antenna up um, as to what's going on in, in kid world because something may have happened repeatedly, but we may not have heard. So what we don't want you to get into is a situation where the first time that you report to a school is actually the 40th time that it's happened. We want those conversations or that awareness about what kid world is like for your child or your student, uh, you know, day by day as much as you can, okay? So that we don't have to get into an argument about whether or not um, there's been a pattern of behavior. We sure hope there hasn't been a pattern of behavior. Um, again, impact. So I just, this is, you know, uh, not, not exactly local, but um, I just wanted to show you a sample. Uh, they call it an anti-bullying policy. You'll notice we don't use the term anti-bullying, not that there's anything terribly wrong with it, but we really, it's not enough to say you're against bullying, you know? I mean, we, we do that as well, but we really want you to be thinking about bullying prevention. So every time I see anti-bullying, I think, oh, you know, I would really love, but that's not what this policy is about. This policy is about what happens. And a lot of uh, district and, um, you know, educational policy sounds like this. Unfortunately, there isn't really a lot of, I don't really get a definition from this. What does it look like? Physical, emotional harm. Um, nobody wants it. Nobody thinks it's great. We're telling you not to do it, but it isn't really concrete. So a lot of people read this and they don't exactly know what to do. They know what not to do. So that's just a sample of what policy often looks like, which doesn't always give us the ideas we know to, to prevent bullying, but just wanted to show that to you. Importantly, uh, or, <laughs> you know, in reality, what one of the biggest stumbling blocks to understanding what bullying is, which stops people all the time, is that they really don't know the difference between conflict and bullying. So you'll find that kids will throw out the bullying word, parents will throw out the bullying word a lot when they mean conflict. And then sometimes people will be talking about conflict and things that just happen, you know, naturally between human beings. Conflict is part of a human life, right? But what they really are talking about is bullying. So here's some ways to differentiate between the two. And if you have younger children under the age of six, you may see behaviors that look like bullying, that, looks, that look aggressive, you know, but are not because we don't even use the word bullying. Um, to describe behavior until the child has developed sufficiently to understand that what they are doing can cause hurt or harm in another human being or in another, right? So up until that point, it's usually five or six um, when children are sort of understanding that their actions affect others and can affect them positively and negatively. We don't use the word bullying. So if anyone in preschool is using that word, please, attempt to redirect them away from it. Um, it's really not appropriate if a child hasn't developed to the point where they understand that they can cause hurt in others. Conflict. In conflict, kids have the same power. They're generally, to use a metaphor, playing the same game. One day, one will be dominant and tell the other one what to do. The next day, it may shift. Um, giving as good as they get, you know, so there's a lot of back and forth. There can be very big feelings in conflict. And sometimes, you know, friendships blow up. They don't, they don't stay. But generally, in conflict, kids have the same amount of power. And when they find that what they've been doing has hurt their friendship or hurt the relationship and could cause the loss of a friend, 
they tend to modify their behavior. Yeah. Or stop. Yeah. Because they don't want to lose friends. Most kids do not want to lose friends. They have no desire to lose the friends they have. They want more, if anything. Uh, but that is, those are the signs of a conflict, right? I will change my behavior because I've hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. I want us to be friends. Let's go play. Yeah. Now in bullying, remember, there's a power imbalance. Person or group doing the bullying has more power. They cannot be stopped usually by the target. And they're not going to stop because when they figure out what bothers you, they're going to keep hitting that button. Yeah. And some of the reasons why it's because bullying you know, when they do a thing that causes a reaction in another child, it gives them a sense of control, gives them a sense of satisfaction. Yeah, though it would be different for every child, but something, the button in them from punching this button in the other kid, something makes it okay and even desirable to do again. So with bullying, unequal power, the kid doing the bullying can keep doing it, because the target really can't get them to stop. And once they know that they're causing her harm in another, they just keep doing it. Really not gonna stop. Um, so that's the difference, right? Conflict, unequal power, don't wanna lose friends. I'm gonna try and change my behavior. And they may need your help. They may need a lot of help to figure out what way to repair the relationship or stop the behavior, but they will try. Bullying, not so much. Uh, this is just to show you that there's just all different kinds of bullying. Uh, we, these are the terms that we use. Um, what's important about this is that you prepare the kids uh, in your lives um, for seeing aggressive behaviors, uh, behaviors that are not friendship behaviors, bullying behaviors that you identify for them as you would their emotions, as you would the natural world. Um, that you point out that there are some things that are absolutely not okay about behaviors. I can tell you where the confusion is always with kids around social behaviors. This is where you as a parent or as an adult authority figure in a child's life can give so much to a child explaining that friends don't make you feel bad. You know, bullying is not a friendship behavior. Uh, I can't tell you how many kids write into our advice column to say, you know, my best friend, I think my best friend is bullying me. You know, first of all, not a friendship behavior. That's definitely something to talk to an adult about. So uh, yeah, emotional social is one of the areas where kids really don't see it coming. And uh, I would say along those lines, the most prevalent form of bullying, the one we used to say it was verbal because so easy, right? To just do a few words you can do with a smile on your face and someone is devastated. Hard for adults to see sometimes. Same with emotional social, but we used to say verbal is the most prevalent. It's not. Uh, there was a 2022 study that came out um, with a meta analysis of a lot of other research, statistically relevant, um, uh, middle school and high school students. And what appears to be the most prevalent form of bullying is actually social exclusion. So when we think of our children who are vulnerable, um, the ones that aren't always able to form um, great social, you know, attachments in their peer group, that's the place, that's the place where we really need to be thinking about what we as advocates can do for them. Um, those social connections uh, uh, lead to a great feeling of secure, you know, security in the group, but also belonging. And so where, you know, yes, it's common to use words, but physical bullying still happens. We want to educate them about anything, you know, that could happen with their bodies. You know, all of these things are important up here. One of the places where we can do the most good is working on, um, issues of social inclusion. Um, we'll get to that in a little while, I'll give you some more ideas on that. The one conversation, oddly, that does not seem to happen as much out in parent world, um, it's not about sex. 
It's about cyber. It's about technology. It's about cyberbullying. And this is funny because cyberbullying is the big monster in every room whenever I go out to speak. It's, it's the topic where people say they, they really, really are concerned and they really you know, need more ideas. And yet the, the cyberbullying conversation, the technology discussions are not happening very often in families. Um, the conversation about ethical use of technology, who are you going to be online? Are you the same person online that you are if, you know, in face-to-face? -face? Those conversations really aren't happening for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure we can all um, understand about now, again, adult behavior online and with technology. Not exactly great models. So again, you're going to hear it again from me, the lines of communication for all of these things to tell to tell the children in our lives, um, you know, not what can happen that there's bad things around every corner, but that to be aware that behavior is not always friendship behavior. Um, things can happen and we need to know if they do happen. Um, you may have noticed so far that I never ever tag a child in development or anyone for that matter, a human being uh, with the word bully. I never use bully as a noun. We don't do that because we believe, especially for children, that it transmits a message that says, this, you're stuck. This cannot change. You know, when you tag a child with, with the name of bully, it does not come off. It doesn't come off. You know, he could be going to his 20th high school reunion and be like, oh, there's Mario. He was a bully. No, never. Um, they don't come off. Those labels don't come off. And so we need to be very careful with our language. This is the thing I see the most out in the world, even with kind and caring people working in nonprofits devoted to bullying prevention. Um, the language around bullying is so harsh and we must never tell children that they are stuck in behavior. We must focus on the behavior because behavior can change. Yeah, character, you know, if we're assassinating the character of a child who's like eight years old, my goodness, what, what are we doing? So we need all the children, you know, all the parts of this bullying puzzle, both the kids who are bullying, the kids who are targeted, we need to be telling them, no, 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 this, we can change this. You need my help or you need, you need the help of your teacher and the people at school, but this can change. This situation can change. So it makes our language a little more uh, complex, but um, please, I, I ask you as you go out into the world, please don't use bully or bullies uh, as a noun, as a title for kids, or for anyone for that matter. Um, we need to make sure the message we're sending kids is that things can change. If we get stuck in our language, the shame and the stigma attached to calling a child a bully will cause a lot of communication problems with that child, may interrupt getting things fixed. Yeah, so if you wanna be productive, if you wanna really make things better uh, in kid world, go away from, from using those labels. So this is just an example of some of the language we do use. The one question, and I'll, I'll pause for a second and see if I've been sufficiently clear, <laughs> but, the big question, of course, is um, who bullies and why, and who is targeted and why. The quick answer, though it's not an easy one, is that anybody can be bullied. Anybody can be bullied, and anybody can bully. Um, many workshops that I've given at the break when they're in person, I'll have a parent sort of sneak up alongside of me and whisper in my ear and say, what if it's your child doing the bullying? I mean, such is the shame attached to this behavior uh, that, that, you know, kids will often easily identify with being targeted, but they will not admit that they themselves have participated in any kind of bullying, even if it was a more passive participation by just hanging out in a group that was doing bullying. It's hard for kids to imagine that they're not the good person, you know, that they're hoping they are. Um, same with us. So who believes in why? Uh, one of the risk factors, and again, this is not a guarantee, but one of the risk factors for being someone who bullies other people or who uses their power over a person negatively is someone who is entitled 
about a sense of difference, around a sense of difference between them and the target or between them and the group they're targeting. Yeah. So it would be, and we see this out in the world a lot around politics. Easy to put you down because you're part of a group that will never respect me or will never be, you know, never uh, be kind to me. So why should I be kind to you? Um, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying this is part of the dynamic. Your religion is not my religion. Your football team is not my football team. Um, sense of entitlement about difference. Okay, so something to think about uh, who is targeted and why. Uh, so for children with disabilities, a child who um, is highly reactive. So I'm thinking of one story where, um, you know, uh, th this child's peers knew that if they made a loud noise, he would literally fall apart and just be sobbing on the floor. And then he was in high school at this point. And so kids would gather and make him explode and he would just end up paralyzed on the floor. Um, things had changed between middle school and high school. There was fewer adult eyes. So that's, that reactivity can be a risk factor. Again, not a guarantee. So we know that children with certain disabilities um, make them more likely to be targeted. But I can tell you right now that the biggest risk factor for being targeted is social isolation. So again, we're back to that, you know, social exclusion piece. When a child is isolated, whether it's been done by the group or they're self-isolating, they have nobody near them most often, obviously. And that being alone uh, ratchets up the risk um, that they'll be bullied. Just people who are doing the bullying generally don't want witnesses. Um, they are dissuaded by even one person next to um, a child who may be a likely target for bullying. Just having one person next to that kid can reduce the risk by quite a lot. So again, here's the piece. When we're looking at community and we're looking at what we can do, working on social isolation, um, that sense of belonging, but that's all protective for children with disabilities. I'm gonna pause very briefly uh, and see if anyone has any questions in particular um, about what's come up so far. There oh, are no questions right now, Judy, it, but I yeah. encourage everyone to, to, if they have any questions, feel free to put them in the, in the chat window. <clears throat> I, have, I have one that came direct to me about intent, which is, which is a brilliant, um, a brilliant question. And I'm going to just pause for now and hopefully we can get back to it. This is something I want to think about. So thank you, Veronese. We'll get back to you um, in a minute. Okay. Let me move on for now. So I, we're going to talk about now, what do we do? What's our advocacy and our self and our, you know, attempts to teach self-advocacy so that our kids can start to, you know, uh, advocate for themselves. So I have this little <laughs> three-step plan, talk with a child, support and empower the child, develop an action plan. I'm going to give you a resource for that. But I realized that there's something about this list I really don't like, which is talk with the child. It's the thing that we as adults um, want to get to pretty quickly. You know, when I talk and give you some advice and we're going to fix this thing. I, so I, if I really had my way here, I would probably cross out talk and with and put in listen to. And again, if you have a child who's largely nonverbal, you, the listening may be very different from what the listening I might do with my kid who's very verbal. Um, so, but listening, attending to, paying attention to the child. And that means the child's story, not the story as I want to hear it or the story that I think happened but letting them give their story as much as we can and supporting that story, we will get more details, of course. And I'm gonna give you a resource for that. But it's very powerful. It sends a huge message to kids uh, when we sit and listen. It says, you are not alone. I'm gonna help you. 
I may not know right now what we're supposed to do or what we can do or what we should do, but you're not alone. We're going to figure this out. Yeah. So here's the resource uh, that we really like. And we've used this with kids of all kinds of cognitive ability, kids with all kinds of, of challenges and issues. Uh, we, and there's a way to use this that is really quite a great um, uh, benefit to you trying to help a kid. So again, nice little three-step plan. Um, this is a handout. So this picture represents a handout that's up on our main, it's actually on all three websites. It's called the Student Action Plan. And it's one, two, three, four pages, um, gives you these steps. Then it gives you some examples. And in there, some of the examples have children, uh, the children have disabilities. And then it gives you this blank grid to fill out. And there's something about that blank white space where you know, you're going to put your ideas in there about what happened and what to do. There's something about that grid that is very de-escalating. And so I think having a plan to follow helps your advocacy hugely, but also helps kids see that there's a process, that there's help, help can happen, and here's how we do it. Also what happens uh, is something kind of magic, and that's step two, that's the self-advocacy piece. This plan doesn't happen without the child's input. However big or small that might be, we can't make this plan to make things better without your ideas, without you telling me what you want to have happen. That's the self-advocacy piece and it's a brilliant piece. Um, if bullying takes power away from a child who's been targeted, self-advocacy gives some power back because they move on their ideas. They show themselves, I can make a change. Again, that message underneath, that message underneath, we can change this situation. You are not stuck in this situation. Yeah, you're not alone. I'm here. We're working through the plan together and we can change this situation. This, I, I am a big fan of this plan. And there's an educator and student guide to this plan as well. This has been translated into several languages. There's definitely a Spanish translation up there for both the plan and the educator parent guide. So I urge you to take a good look at that Bullying can cause a lot of big feelings in adults. Uh, we want to fix that as soon as possible. This will step you through it in a way that actually, you know, benefits the kid. Uh, and again, this plan doesn't happen until they get in there and say what they want to have happen. We've used it very successfully. Um, so uh, I urge you to take a look at that. Oh, hello. Oh, goodness me. Sorry. Um, this is a document I'm really proud of. I worked on it last year with one of our uh, parent advocates who is a disability rights lawyer. And um, it was an upgrade from a previous document about using the IEP. But what we discovered was that very often um, there were children out there who didn't have the IEP or 504 um, and they still had a disability and they were being bullied for it. So we wanted to create something that that helped um, create a plan. But obviously using the IEP is one of the ways that you can work on prevention. And remember, we gotta, we gotta be working on prevention, not just intervention. And the IEP is a place where you can put in some um, safety and security uh, items. Uh, and you know your IEP team should want that as well um, to get ahead of things, you know? Not because you want to fill up the IEP report with things that you know may not happen. Oh, that that doesn't happen. We don't see that here very much. That doesn't happen. No, we want to get ahead of it and be thinking. Okay, who's the adult my kid can go to? Is there someone that really gets my kid uh, and and hears them and sees them? Yeah, is that the adult? You know, in case something happens and my kid is uncomfortable and can't express himself, is there one person who really you know who who would see that? Um, Reporting is a big place <laughs> at schools that where everyone, or not everyone, but often staff might have a different sense of what reporting is. So some schools, if the word bullying is used, that's an instant referral. No matter what, that's an instant referral. You use the bullying word, you're going to go, you know, that's going straight to the assistant principal. 
Um, but in some places, many places, teachers have to, and the aides have to decide right on the fly, is this bullying, is it not? That's tremendously difficult sometimes. So just, just make sure there's clarity around that. Um, you know, you could put in things about, you know, having an adult, keeping an eye on your child, but just know that as they get older, socially, that can be very, very difficult for them. So we should be careful about some things like that. But finding ways for them to move through a school um, safely, um, those, those are pretty important because we know that a lot of bullying happens in areas where there are fewer adult eyes, bathrooms, hallways, um, there's always something about the line for PE. I, I, I'm always getting reports about kids who are waiting to go into PE or in the line to leave PE. It's always, I don't know what it is, but that's one of those things. Obviously, um, resets and nutrition when they're out, um, out on, you know, in, in, in the yard or something. And that's the place too, where schools really need to be training staff uh, who are out there watching recess and watching this social laboratory, which is how kids learn how to be social. When they're out there, they've got to do what they got to do. They're growing up. They got to figure it out. Sometimes things are, you know, things don't look good. And a trained eye, um, and it's not easy, but a trained eye um, who's used to looking at kid behavior and who knows the kids, who's connected to the kids, is going to be better at deciding that what they've seen is conflict or bullying. Um, and their antenna might go up and say, hmm, this doesn't seem right, and how to handle that. So reporting, but also being trained uh, to understand the various children that they're dealing with, because certain disabilities may, you know, again, they may not have acquired and they may not acquire the social skills to play harmoniously with other kids. So we need, you know, the, the adults around children with disabilities like that to understand what they're seeing, understand how to redirect it. Uh, and so it does help sometimes to have, uh, if you can get it, and this isn't easy, but to get a training uh, for school staff. I was, I've been in many of those meetings and when I can say that as a faculty, despite the fact that we are in many meetings, we were very grateful for specific information on kids. And we knew we needed it to even before we had the meeting. So these, if you can get some of those kinds of trainings that can help. Um, and this last one, I'm, I'm always a little mixed about including this one because um, I assume without questioning that staff knows <laughs> that every child has a right to be safe at school. But the way that idea gets implemented is of course, very different. And safety might mean allowing some things to work themselves out. If it's conflict, giving children the tools to work on conflict, sure. Um, but that when it gets into a question of safety, that then we, we know we have to bring other adults in and we really need to do something, not just let it go. So there's some things we can do with the IEP. Little roadmap for you for prevention. Um, Obviously, we're what three quarters of the way through the school year. So we are looking at next year, yeah, for a lot of you. But if there's a safety thing, I don't get to it. So, but we'll get to the intervention slide after this. But for prevention, obviously, the earlier you get those prevention ideas in the minds of staff or in your mind, the better. Um, uh, when you identify the adults around your child at school who, again, and I'm using the air quotes, get your kid, right? They really see this kid. They really hear this kid. They get what he or she are about. Um, do get to know them. They see your child differently, which is a good thing, really good thing. Uh, if you can, again, uh, giving information on your child's disability is a good idea. It's difficult to get uh, faculty staff time. Um, and as a parent, you'll have to initiate it, most likely with a lot of energy, but there may be a way to get that done. Uh, earlier in lower school, probably a little bit easier than later, but I would still try. And then making sure that the IEP safeguards are in prior to the start of the year, or you revisit them. And again, parents of children with disabilities are fierce. I know that you can get this thing, you can get these things done. Uh, intervention. 
when your antenna go up and you think something's going on, uh, open those lines of communication that I hope are already open. Um, sit down with the action plan, make your own action plan. If it involves the school in any way, even if it's after school, on the bus, uh, it's through technology, they need to know. And keep a record of everything that all the communications, who you've had them with, what the uh, follow-up is to be, what kind of time frame the follow-up is, um, who will be following up, all of those details, keep a record of all of that. Um, and then from what you learn, when you have to intervene in something, incorporate those ideas back into the IEP. Um, sometimes you will have to go to the school and sit in the office. You just will have to. People won't return calls. They won't return your emails. Keep a record of all that too. But I've had many, many parents who just went and sat in the office and told principal or assistant principal sat with them. They just didn't leave. And sometimes that happens. Again, schools are under siege uh, often. Uh, since the pandemic, I was just talking to Mario about this, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of underfunding for special ed, it's a lack of staff very often. Um, I'm not making excuses, but it is it's difficult to pin people down uh, and they still need to do the right thing. So you may have to be very vigorous uh, with your advocacy, but Again, that is something that um, most people who work and care for children with disabilities are used to doing. Uh, and hopefully with the information here in this presentation, you'll, you'll know that it is not only your right to do so, but that's just, that's just how it goes. And since the pandemic, I mean, we know that during the pandemic and you know, post-pandemic um, that kids in special ed are not getting all that they need. They didn't during the pandemic and they're still not, we're still not to the place where we need to be. So your energy in intervening is gonna be key, key in getting something done. Uh, I am not a lawyer, so I will make this as clear as I can. And then we'll be wrapping up pretty quickly. Um, when the bullying is done uh, based on the student's disability or your child's disability, uh, and it interferes with their education. That is a case for uh, discriminatory harassment. Okay, so then it crosses the line. It isn't just bullying anymore. It's based on um, the student's disability. So it becomes a whole other order of thing. Yeah, more serious. And the school definitely has a responsibility to fix both types. Um, but that document that I just showed you a couple slides ago um, uh, has some examples in it of different cases where um, the bullying was revolving around disability and how the how the parents worked with the school, how the school worked as a team to um, fix those situations. Um, so, but just know that if you're in this zone, you've, you've come up to disability harassment, um, there are federal laws that um, should protect a child with disabilities, protect anyone with disabilities. Um, but it's very difficult once you get to this place to say that it's actually happening. That's the reality of it. So um, you, again, keep records, keep, keep uh, as much detail as you can about what's happening and know that it's the school's responsibility um, to create uh, an environment for your child where this doesn't occur. They have a responsibility to fix the situation. Not easy, but they do. Um, so investigations are where time often gets spent. Uh, and my concern and, and our concern at the National Bullying Prevention Center is that while the investigation is happening, uh, our, the kids are safe. So I understand that things have to unfold and we have to look into this kind of thing. And there are various people that might look into it. Usually it's an assistant principal or assistant headmaster. Sometimes it's a school resource officer. Sometimes it's a counselor. There'll be people trying to figure out what really happened. But while that's going on, my first question would always be, how are we keeping this child safe? How are we keeping this atmosphere around all of these children healthier and safer? Um, 
so that this doesn't happen again. But these are some of the responsibilities here that a school has. Seems pretty obvious. You'll see this in, in your parent student handbook as well. Just hard in practice to make sure that it happens. Um, best practices, we want you know school to be not just for academics and, and skill building on those things, but that our children are using that social laboratory that school does so, so well uh, to have appropriate social interactions that we're modeling them as adults and that kids are learning as much as they can about how to be friends, how to have a good relationship with someone, how to learn through a good relationship. And that when we have to intervene, um, that we are creating plans when we're dealing with children with disabilities, plans that fit them, you know, that are individualized for them so that they can understand what to do and learn better social skills. I'm going to just pass this just because I want to wrap it up. But um, obviously, we think that there's the vast majority of kids at school are not involved or not directly involved in bullying. We know that from the research. Empowering them is pretty critical to the health of the community. Whatever we can do in that regard will be really great. <laughs> will really be great for our vulnerable kids. So lots of ideas up on our websites about doing this. And kids really want to be good peer advocates. They really do. They write in all the time to say, my friend's being bullied. What can they do? Or just there's bullying at my school and I don't like it. I don't want it to be there. What can we do? So yes, lots we can do there. And long-term, and this is for us as adults, we must, must do more than promote positive social behaviors. We must show children what they look like. The three that so far the researchers saying are protective, kindness, no surprise, acceptance of difference, and inclusion. Those are the three that when they are uh, vigorously, robustly present in communities, appear to really be protective, at least from letting bullying flourish, right? So it's harder for bullying to take a hold as a cultural value in communities where people are seeing acts of acceptance of difference, seeing an act of inclusion, act of kindness. For me, just my personal opinion, the linchpin here is probably acceptance of difference. That's the one. Um, that's the hardest one to get concrete about. Kindness and inclusion, we've done a lot. You know, you can think of a lot of the concrete examples for children, small and large, uh, of, of those two things. But that acceptance of difference piece, ah, oh, that's the one. So whatever you can do on that one, uh, you have my support. We have lots of resources to back this up. We are trying all the time to work on what, you know, would help build healthier communities. And these are three of the behaviors we need to see the most. Um, here's where you can uh, find us. Again, explore these sites. If you have kids, let them explore these sites. Uh, and that's my email down there. Um, obviously, Task knows how to get in touch with me. But I'm happy to be of service to you. And I'm happy to stick around if people have questions. I'm only three minutes over. And since we didn't start till like five minutes after, I think. <laughs> I think I did. Yeah, no, you're good, Judy. Uh, ah, thank, thank you so you. much for that information. Uh, I'm going to stop recording now and then. I'll share my screen a little bit, have you guys all complete a, a survey. And then there have been some questions that have yeah, trickled in we'll and get started uh, on those um, after I share uh, the, the survey QR code here, okay? Give me one second, there's a parent trying to join. Oh. All right. Yeah, Veronique has some amazing questions here that, that came to me directly. So you you don't see them. Perfect. 